What's up, New Spring? Welcome to our gathering today at all of our campuses across South Carolina. What a joy to be able to spend some time in this series unpacking what God's purpose is for you. Today, we're gonna talk specifically about God's purpose for his people. And I don't know about you, but for the past week, I've been reflecting on last week's message and I've had numerous conversations already with people who are really beginning to pray and seek the Lord for his purpose for their life. And um, you know, I'm sitting at a table now. This table for me represents a place I've spent a lot of time over the years. Um, I love people, I love talking, and I love food. So if you put people, talking, and food together, I'm kind of in heaven. And I literally have met with hundreds and hundreds of people over the course of my 33 years in ministry at tables just like this where the conversations will, no matter where they start, they end up somewhere around God's will for their life, God's plan for their life, God's purpose for their life. And I can just remember so many of those conversations, I felt like whether I was the one giving advice or whether I was the one asking for advice, because I've also had that happen in my life. I've, I've never been so many times where the conversation ends up being, well, I just don't know what God wants me to do. Do I marry this guy? Do I marry this girl? Do, do I take this job? Do, do I retire at 62 or 65 or 67? Do I sell this house and buy another one? Do I move to that new city for the promotion? And, and here's what we know. We know that God has a purpose, and if God has a purpose for your life, you wanna find it. But we're, we talked about this last week. If God has a plan, then you have a purpose. What I wanna do today is I want us to spend a little bit of time looking at a bigger picture of God's overall purpose because God has a purpose for humanity. We learned about that last week. Today, I want us to learn about God's purpose for his people. Next week, we'll talk a little bit more specifically about individual purpose and what God may be leading you to do and how to find that. But today, we're going to let Jesus instruct us. We're gonna let Jesus lead us. We're gonna look to the words of Jesus and we're gonna let Jesus talk to us from the scriptures about God's purpose for his people. God is creating a people. We are called the church. And if you will and if I will lean in to what God has already revealed in his word to us about his purpose and plan for our lives, we believe that you will walk in a path that will lead you to God's specific plans and purposes. But when you understand that his purpose is bigger than just you individually and me individually, and that we are part of a people that God has a purpose for, it demystifies a lot of the mystery surrounding God's will. So as we dive in today, Take a deep breath and relax. We're gonna remove a lot of the stress. We're gonna take away a lot of the worry and a lot of the unknown and some of the anxiety that you might feel when you're trying so hard to discern what God's specific will might be for you. We're gonna take some of that weight off today and we're gonna see what God has for us, the people of God. And there are really only gonna be two main points to this message today. They're very simple, but they're very profound. We'll start off with what I believe to be, straight from the mouth of Jesus, God's ultimate purpose for all of us, his people. And here it is, are you ready for it? This is, this is gonna be really, really important for you and for me for the rest of our lives because it's important to the people of God. Here is God's purpose for his people. His purpose, our purpose, is to know Jesus. Our purpose as the people of God is to know Jesus. And as I've sat at table after table in restaurants, breaking bread together, sharing a meal with an individual brother or with a married couple or a dating couple, as Shari and I have counseled people through different situations, I always come back to this truth that when you don't know exactly what you're supposed to do individually, we can all know that God's ultimate purpose for us is to know Jesus. And as a matter of fact, Jesus said this. Let me read it to you directly from the mouth of Jesus himself. John 17, three, 
Jesus said these words during a time of intimacy with his father where Jesus is praying to his heavenly father. And in the midst of that prayer, we believe that John the apostle was there with Jesus when Jesus was praying this prayer. And John recorded this prayer as he wrote it down in the book that we call the Gospel of John. And I just wanna read this one verse to us today as the family of God, no ordinary family, so that we can relieve some of that pressure and take away some of that stress of worrying what will happen if we miss God's purpose for our life. This is God's purpose according to Jesus. John 17, three. Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. This is eternal life. The definition of eternal life, the definition of joy, the definition of purpose is that we know God the Father and that we know Jesus Christ the way that God revealed himself to humanity. Now I wanna unpack this a little bit because that's easy to say, but there is a depth and a richness to this truth, okay? So I know some people, I actually know quite a few people. More people know me than I know people. Dan and Brad and I like to joke around a lot in our teaching team meetings that so many people see us on a stage preaching that we better be on our toes when we're out in public because people are watching that you don't know are watching. It's amazing to me how when you know somebody, you know their motives. When you know someone, you know what they're like, right? And so as a church, we are all one big family. There are no celebrities. There are no people on a pedestal. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ, and we're all on a journey to know Jesus better. So whenever I travel around and I meet people and I meet them for the first time, that's my first introduction to them. But then later on, I get to know them a little bit better. I find out who they are, what they're like, their story, their background, where they come from. And as you get to know someone past that initial meeting, you find out what they're really like. Raise your hand if you've been married for more than a year at all of our campuses. Could you just put those hands up if you have been married for more than a year? And how many of you are happy about that? Can, can you keep those hands up? I saw more hands go up right then. Okay, some of you are asleep during the first question. You know what happens when you're married to someone? You meet them, and however you met them, you fall in love with them, they take your breath away, they smile at you across a crowded room, or maybe after you turned them down 18 times on the 19th invitation, you finally said yes just to get him to leave you alone, but then you found out he was kind of dorky, kind of a nerd, but he was so cute, and now you're married to him and y'all have grandkids. Okay, so... You meet someone, you fall in love, and you think you know them. As a matter of fact, most good marriage advice, most good marriage counselors will tell you, get to know them before you get married. Find out who they are, find out what they're like, find out what makes them tick, get to hear their story. But all of us who have been married for any amount of time, you know that you can only know somebody so much to a certain level until you have spent lengthy amounts of time with them. My wife and I have been married for 20 years and I want to say that my wife is surprising me today in ways I never dreamed she would surprise me. I know Shari, but I am learning new things about her every single day. If I cannot mine the depths of the beauty and mystery of my wife's personality, then how much more would it be impossible for me to ever know all that there is to know about our big, mysterious, beautiful, loving, kind God and his purposes for my life? I'm learning new things about Shari every day, and she is a mere mortal made in the image of God. God sent his son Jesus to us, and, and when we meet him, that's the introduction, but that introduction leads us into a relationship where for weeks and months and years, and dare I even say decades, we get to know him in new ways. We get to experience him in more intimate settings. We come to a gathering on Sunday, and we feel his presence and his spirit as we lift 
lift our hands, as we fall on our knees, as we respond, as we go to connect classes. There is so much we don't know about Jesus, but don't let that keep you from knowing Jesus because you can know him, you just have to meet him first. When I met Shari, she literally, and I'm not just saying this, she took my breath away. And as I get to know her more, I love her more deeply. How much more can we get to know Jesus and fall deeper in love with him every single day? This is our purpose. And notice, it's not just your purpose. It's not just my purpose. It's our purpose Everything we do as a teaching team, everything our creative teams do across our campuses, everything our lead team prays about and makes decisions about regarding our church and our direction, we all do that. We do every bit of that for the sake of you and I, of us, knowing Jesus. Now, there's a difference in knowing about someone and knowing someone, okay? We're not talking about knowing facts about Jesus, like a historical figure. I know facts about George Washington. He was our first president. I know facts about Michael Jordan, a great basketball player. I know facts about Rosa Parks. When she refused to move from her seat on the bus, she began the civil rights movement. I know facts about Martin Luther King Jr. My, aunt, my wife's uncle is his chief biographer and the world's greatest expert on MLK, but I've never met any of those four people. But I know Jacob King because he lives in my house and I pay his bills. I know Joseph King because I drive him to basketball practice and I take him to school in the mornings. I know Brad Cooper and Dan Leanne and Shane Duffy. I know Josh Seaball. I know Sam Gibson. I know Lee McDermott. God does not want us to just know things about his son. God wants us to actually know his son because that is the source of the greatest joy and the greatest pleasure in all of the world. And that is our purpose. But it doesn't just stop there. There's actually more. Okay, two main points to my sermon today. I'm halfway done. Can you believe that? Some of y'all are like, he's halfway done. He's only been preaching for eight minutes. Is he gonna finish in 16 minutes? In Jesus' name, no. But I am gonna say that when you know Jesus, the second step, the second part of our purpose which is connected to knowing Jesus is simply this. Our purpose is to make Jesus known. Our purpose is to tell other people about Jesus. Our purpose is to use whatever gifts God has given us to introduce people to Jesus who has changed our life. Our purpose is to tell our story as broken and busted as it might be to show people that God loves broken people just like us. Our purpose is to testify. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. I once lived in darkness, but now I walk in the light of Christ. Our purpose is not just to know Jesus and keep it to ourselves. Our purpose as the people of God is to make Jesus known. And Jesus said that. As a matter of fact, I just wanna read his words to you from Matthew chapter five. I told you, I would rather Jesus tell me what his purpose is for my life than for me to try to figure it out from any other source. So let me show you what Jesus says in Matthew chapter five. We we commonly refer to this as the Sermon on the Mount. And if you've ever been to Israel, you've probably been to the location where they believe Jesus said these words. And if you're going uh, on the trip this coming spring with me and Brad and Dan and some other folks in our church, we'll take you here to this spot where Jesus said these words. And I wanna show you what Jesus said is the purpose for all of us. John 17, three, it's to know Christ. And in Matthew chapter five, verses 13 through 16, it is to make him known. Here's what Jesus says in Matthew chapter five, verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt should lose its taste, how can it be made salty? It's no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand, and it gives light for all who are in the house. 
in the same way. I love how Jesus connects these three things to us. In the same way, let your light shine. Do you see that purpose there? Do you hear that purpose? Do you hear Jesus speaking identity to us? Do you hear Jesus giving us power? Do you hear Jesus giving us authority? Do you hear Jesus telling us who we are and what we get to do in the same way? Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. I learned years ago when you're reading the Bible, anytime you see the phrase, so that, pay attention because it's gonna give you an answer to the question, why? Why should we do this? So that others will see our good works and brag on us, no. Boast on us, no. Notice us, no. Make a big deal out of us, uh uh-uh. So that they will glorify our Father who is in heaven. So we know Jesus and we make him known. We know Jesus and we talk about him. We love Jesus and we tell others about him. We worship Jesus and then we invite other people to come worship him with us. We meet Jesus and we know other people who haven't met him yet, but we want them to experience the joy that we have, so we develop relationships with them. We sit at tables with them. We drink coffee with them. We go to the lake with them. We go to ball games with them. We invite them to our home and they sit in our living rooms and we get to know them so that one day they'll notice in us something that makes them curious as to why we are the way that we are, knowing Jesus and making him known. Have you ever wondered why we as a church have the mission statement, New Spring Church exists to connect people to Jesus and to each other? We take it straight from the Bible. We take it straight from the mouth of Jesus to know Jesus and make him known, to connect with Jesus and to connect others with him. So, Jesus basically said three things in Matthew chapter five. He compared us to three things. I wanna unpack this briefly. First of all, Jesus says we are the salt of the earth. We are the salt of the earth. That sounds great. As a matter of fact, if you're an old timer, I never call people old. I just say that you are seasoned. If you grew up in the deep south, and uh, you, you may have heard this phrase before, Recently, I met someone who knew my dad when he was still alive, and he, uh, he said, your dad, Joe King, was salt of the earth. Well, we, we know that's positive, but what does it actually mean when Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth? Well, real briefly, what does salt do? And <laughs> some of y'all like, raises my blood pressure. <laughs> huh. Yeah, well, salt had a different purpose when Jesus spoke of it in Matthew 5. And I want you to identify yourself as the salt of the earth, okay? First of all, salt was valuable. It was extremely valuable. Salt preserved food. Salt kept people alive because it kept the food in a position and a situation where you could eat it and not get poison from it. It preserved meat. Salt was also so valuable that the Romans would literally pay They're soldiers in bags of salt. Okay, so if you have a job, you agree to work for a boss, and every Friday or every other Friday or the first of every month, you get paid, and you get paid because you make a, starts with S and ends with allery. You get paid a salary. Do you know where we get our word salary from? Salt because it was so valuable in the days of Jesus, they would pay your wages with bags of salt. You know what Jesus is saying to us? You have value. You're made in my image. You are my ambassadors. You are my sons, my daughters. You are my friends. You are my disciples. You have value. But there's something else that salt does. Now, I don't don't know this for a fact because I've never been able to have anybody actually admit it, but I've heard that if you go to a bar and you see, and I've been around bars, and I've sat at bars before uh, to eat or or hang out with friends or whatever. They put out, the bartenders know this, apparently, they put out little snacks. And what are the snacks that they put out? Cheetos, Fritos, Edos, Doritos, Taquitos, anything that ends with Edos, right? Uh, Salted peanuts, salted chips, pretzels. The common denominator is everything they put out has salt in it. Why? Because when you eat salt, you get thirsty. 
our, ooh, our great joy is that when we meet Jesus, he changes us from the inside out so much that as we shine our light in the world, we are making him known and we're like the salt that makes people thirsty. We should make people curious about the way we live, the way we spend our money, the way we pursue uncommon unity the way that we treat people, the way that we act in public, these are ways that we can be the salt of the earth. We are that. Because Jesus said we were. He also said, you are, we are the light of the world. What does that mean? We are the light of the world. He literally says, you are the light of the world. Now, if you trace the concept of light in the Bible, it starts in Genesis. So when Jesus says that we, his people, are the light of the world, here's what he's doing. He's speaking purpose to us. He's giving us identity. Because when you know who you are, you will know what to do. And so many of us get, I do, we get so wrapped up on trying to find out the particulars of the mysteries of God's specific plan for our individual lives that we miss what he's already revealed to us as the people of God that we should be pursuing anyway. So when Jesus says, you are the light of the world, he's identifying us. He's giving us purpose. He's giving us a name. We are the light. What does light do? Well, it illuminates If you go all the way back to Genesis, when God first created the world, the Bible says that God took nothing. The the world was, the universe was formless and void, and and the Spirit of God was hovering over the chaos and the nothingness, right? And then God began to speak, and as God began to speak, he separated things, and one of the first things he separated, he separated light from darkness. And if you trace that all throughout the Bible, you'll see that God called a people unto himself, beginning at the very start. Abraham then becomes the father of a nation. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they eventually, through their lineage, lead to King David, then to Jesus, and then Jesus would identify himself as the light of the world. John's gospel uses that word over and over again, that Jesus was the light, that he came into the darkness and the darkness did not receive him. But to those who did believe in him, he gave the rights to become the children of God. So what does light do? It pushes back darkness. So you know what we get to do as a church? This is our purpose. You know what we get to do as a community? You know what we get to do as a no ordinary family? We get to sit at tables like this and invite people to pull up a chair and join us. We get to sit in coffee shops and restaurants and living rooms and dens and kitchens and we get to invite people to come and learn what Jesus is all about as we continue learning how to know him better. We get to say to people, you know, you struggle with depression, I've struggled with depression. Let's talk about it because, hey, we're all broken. We need Jesus. You lost a spouse, I lost a spouse. You're divorced, I understand. You have a wayward child that's on drugs and won't come around and they always lie to you. I understand that. That's happened to me. And we get to invite them to come and sit at the table and guess what we're doing? We're shining that light into dark places. We don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to have a PhD or a degree from seminary. You just have to tell your story because we're the light of the world. And when we speak light into dark situations, there is no depth of darkness that can withstand the smallest amount of light. Light is stronger than darkness. We are stronger than the enemy. We, the church, are stronger than sin. We are stronger than death, not because we're awesome, but because Jesus is. That guy came back from the dead. I'm following him. I believe whatever he says. I go wherever he leads. If he says it, I believe it, right? That's who we are. We are the light of the world because we reflect his light. But there's one more thing that Jesus said about us. We are a city on a hill. We are a city on a hill. Now, what in the world does that mean? Well, If you do get to go to Israel at some point in your life, or if you've ever been, you can see exactly what this looks like. Jesus is standing there on the the shore of the Sea of Galilee, this freshwater lake, and he's teaching Matthew 5 to his disciples, and 
he says what we've just read. You are the, the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. And here's what Jesus was doing. He was using an object lesson. He's standing there near Capernaum on that side of the lake, and he's pointing across the lake to a sprawling city that went from the edge of the water all the way up the side of a mountain, and that city was called Tiberias. It was named after Tiberius Caesar. That city is still there today. I've eaten in that city. I've spent the night with my wife in, that, in a hotel in that city. I'll be going there again pretty soon. It's a real city. You can't hide a city on a hill. You can't camouflage a city on a hill. David Copperfield cannot snap his fingers and do a trick and make a city on a hill disappear. You can see it from miles away. And the closer you get to it, the bigger it is. Can you just now understand and make the connection to what Jesus is saying about your purpose and my purpose as a people of God? We are that city on a hill. And, and, and when you're the light of the world, just imagine in that day, someone lighting an olive oil clay lamp at the end of the day. The sun is setting, there's no electricity. You don't flip a switch, you have to light that little lamp. And Jesus says, you don't put it under a basket, you, you set it on a lampstand so the whole room can be illuminated. But then Jesus takes it another step and he says, all together, all of your lights, everybody among the people of God, the church of Jesus Christ, together, you're like that city, and he points to Tiberias. You are that city on a hill. One light can illuminate a little bit, but all of our lights together illuminate a great area. People can see it from miles away. And when they see the city on a hill, they are not so impressed with one little light over here and one little light down here and one little light way out there. They see the city and they are impressed with the city. We are the church. The church is the city on a hill from Matthew chapter five. And that is why we give away so much of our tithes and offerings to ministries and church planting around the world. It's why we do what we do to build the kingdom because we have a kingdom mentality. It's why we pursue uncommon unity. We wanna lead the way in racial reconciliation in South Carolina. We should do a better job than the government could ever do in reconciling people of different cultures and backgrounds because we all sit at the same table that was prepared for us by the same God. We are a city on a hill, but here's the thing about a city. You can't be a city by yourself. Can't do it. It's impossible. I can't be a city all by myself. I've got a light and I'm gonna let it shine. But I'm not gonna be so confused with and consumed with trying to find God's specific plan for my personal life that I miss the bigger picture. I'm part of a family. I'm part of a city. My light is one light among many to help people know Jesus. So when you're trying to make a decision in your life and you don't know what God's specific plan might be, ask yourself these two questions. Will this help me know Jesus? Will this help me help others know Jesus? Because that's our purpose, to know Jesus and to make him known. It really is that simple. When you're trying to decide where to go to college, what job to take, when to retire, what car to buy, what house to move into. When you're trying to make a big decision regarding your future at the stage of life you're in, ask yourself those two questions. Will this help me know Jesus? Will this help me help others know Jesus? But the real question that I, I wanna ask you is do you know Jesus? If that's the purpose, if that's what we were born for, if that's what God created us primarily to do, to know Jesus, John 17, three, then I just have to ask tens of thousands of people across South Carolina at all of our campuses right now, have you ever met him? Because you can't know someone until you meet that person. That's always the first step. The first step is to meet Jesus. And then once you meet Jesus, you get to know Jesus. And then once you get to know Jesus, he changes you so much and you're so filled with joy that you've gotta make him known. You've gotta brag about Jesus, talk about Jesus, boast about Jesus, share about Jesus, testify about Jesus. Do you see how this just relieves the stress of trying to figure out God's will? 
It just alleviates so much of that pressure and anxiety, but it all starts with this one question. Do you know Jesus? Not do you know about Jesus like Abraham Lincoln? No, no, no. Jesus was more than a historical figure. He is the living, resurrected Son of God, and he wants a relationship with you. But you've got to meet him before you can get to know him. Something um, pretty profound happened to me yesterday that I think will illustrate this point for us as a church. I shared with our church on Father's Day, it was my first, uh, my first day back from sabbatical, and I told you the story of how, with the help of Ken and Meg Wilson here at the church, I was able to locate my biological family. I'm adopted, I'd um, never met my, anybody in my biological family, did not know who they were or where they were or if there were even any of them still left. And I was able to locate them through Ancestry.com and I have had conversations with some of them over the phone. I've FaceTimed with some of them and I've texted with some of them, but yesterday was the big day. And yesterday morning, my wife, Shari, and my two boys got in the truck and we drove down to, to Conway, South Carolina, which our Myrtle Beach campus knows where that's at. And um, we went to a little church out in a swamp, Polly's Swamp Baptist Church, that was apparently started by my great, great, great uncle who was a circuit riding evangelist back in the 1800s. Go figure. We're going down there to meet my family for the first time, just my dad's side. And the whole way down there, Shari's like, how you feel? And I'm like, I'm so excited. And I just can't hide it. I'm about to lose control and I think I like it. <laughs> Little Pointer Sisters Theology, 1983. All right, giving the cultural reference there. We pull in the parking lot of the church and I get out and my cousin Mark and his sister Kelly are there. They're about my age. I gave them a big hug. And I knew that right inside that door were about 40 of my relatives in that little fellowship hall. And I knew that the minute I opened that door, I could not predict what I would say, do, or feel. And I opened the door and I met my family. They were all waiting on us. They're all looking at us. And I walk in and y'all know how shy and quiet I am. And I said, hey everybody, I'm Clayton. And then I started crying and I dehydrated. I cried so much. But the best part, I have a sister and her name is Paige. And she was the first person I saw when I opened the door. And she was the one I wanted to meet the most. She's got a little boy. He's about 10 months old. And when I saw her, I just ran to her. And I hugged her. She was holding her boy. And, and I'm just hugging my sister that I'm meeting for the first time. And, and I felt like I was struck by a bolt of lightning. Like really good lightning. Like healthy lightning life-giving lightning, loving, warm, gentle lightning. <laughs> and when I met my sister, that was the first step in now getting to know my sister. That's my sister's story. You see where I'm going with this? For some of you, that's your Jesus story and that's right now. You've gotta meet Jesus and then get to know him. And what we've prayed for, and we've already saw, seen it today across our campuses, dozens and dozens of people have already been saved today because they met Jesus for the first time. I wanna invite you, if you've never met him, meet him right now by asking him to save you and spend the rest of eternity getting to know him. So would you close your eyes and open your hearts with me right now across all of our campuses? If the Spirit of God has tugged on your heart and you know you need to meet Jesus so that you can get to know him and you wanna be saved, and you wanna nail it down, the best way to know you're saved is to ask Jesus. He'll never tell you no. He's already said yes on the cross. So if you wanna meet Jesus right now, pray this to him right where you sit. Your words, not my words, but I'm gonna lead you and I'm gonna help you connect with Jesus. And if you'll open your heart, he'll come in right now. Pray this to him if you wanna meet him and know him. 
Say this in your heart to him. Jesus, I want to meet you right now. So I invite you into my life. I open my heart to you. I give you control. I repent of my sin. I believe you love me. And I want to know you better starting right now. Thank you for saving me, Jesus. Now I'm yours. I'm gonna ask you to keep your eyes closed and your hearts open across all of our campuses. And I wanna ask you a question. It's very simple. Did you just pray that prayer to Jesus? If you did, congratulations. You just crossed over from death to life. You just met Jesus. But the second question I wanna ask you is this. If you did just pray that prayer, would you do something very simply? Would you raise your hand right now at your campus if you just prayed that prayer and keep it up for a moment? I want you to raise your hand. I want you to keep it up. Just raise it up. Don't be embarrassed or ashamed. You're in the family. Raise your hand up right now. Keep them up for a moment. I can only count in this room, but I just wanna celebrate and build some faith right now. I, just from where I'm sitting, I can see, keep your hands up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. You can put your hands down across every campus. Everybody open your eyes and look at me for a moment. Just in this room, 15 people just responded by meeting Jesus and inviting Jesus to save them. And if I could have dinner with you, if you and I could sit down at a table at Sullivan's and Anderson, which is my favorite restaurant, I right now would be making a scene. I would be embarrassed in the place because I would say, you just met Jesus and I would flip that. No, I wouldn't do that. But we wanna celebrate with you meeting Jesus. We wanna honor what the Lord's done in you. So I'm gonna ask right now at every one of our campuses, can we all stand to our feet together? We're gonna respond and we respond every time we gather in three ways. We respond by worship. We're gonna take up our offering. We respond um, by prayer and we respond uh, by giving, we'll pass the, the plates as we take up our offering. We'll sing together. But here's what I want to ask. Our care team members, when I'm praying, they're gonna begin to make their way toward the front of our auditoriums at your campus while I'm praying. And for those of you that just prayed to receive Christ, please hear me. I'm gonna be as clear as I can be. We want to celebrate your salvation. We also wanna help you grow now that you've met Jesus, we want you to know him and make him known. And you can't do that by yourself because you can't be a city by yourself. So when I say amen, our care teams are gonna begin to move toward the front. They'll probably move while I'm praying, actually. And if you are one that just prayed to receive Christ, 15 of you in this room, I want you to meet. You're already standing up. It's not gonna be awkward. We're gonna cheer and rejoice and celebrate when I say amen if you pray to receive Christ, I want you to immediately step out of your aisle and walk to the front and one of our care team members will pray with you. And if you need prayer for anything else, if there's anything else in your life, if you need to be a part of our church or sign up for connect classes or volunteer or you're, you need prayer for healing or, or anything else in your life, that is what our response time is for. So for those of you that just got saved, come immediately after I say amen. And for the rest of you that need anything, come and let us serve you by praying for you. Father, thank you that you sent your son, Jesus. Jesus, thank you that you died on the cross in our place and were raised again for our new life. Holy Spirit, thank you for how you draw people into the kingdom to know you and make you known. And now I pray that people would begin to move even as I prepare to say amen across our campuses. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.